introduce Ed, um, Ed Macy, who is our presenter today. He's going to be talking about the operational aspects of tree protection ordinances. Ed Macy is recently retired from the Southern Region Urban Forestry Group um, for, as uh, part of the USDA Forest Service in Atlanta, Georgia. He has nearly 40 years of experience in urban forestry, having served with the Forest Service as a county arborist and a boricultural um, consultant. Upon his retirement years, uh, up until his retirement years, he directed the Southern Region Urban Forestry Program for the Forest Service, administering grants and educational programs that help states deliver their urban forestry programs, helps community-based groups plant and maintain trees, and improve um, the environment where people live, work, and play. Ed also strongly supports urban forestry research and science delivery, having established the Centers for Urban and Interface Forestry, co-located at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, and the Uni University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. His educational background includes a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Hort and Arboriculture from the University of California, Davis, and a Master's in Urban Forest Ecology from State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University. Ed currently volunteers as a board member for Asheville Greenworks and as a member of the Asheville Tree Commission. So with that, Ed, I'm going to stop sharing my computer and give you a couple of seconds to uh, switch over to yours. Um, and while Ed is doing that, um, I just wanted to um, let everybody know I'll have the education credit stuff up at the end of the presentation. And there are a couple of documents that Ed's going to be referring to in his presentation that, um, that I'll make sure is available uh, for everybody to download um, at the end of their presentation. So with that, you are uh, good to go, Ed. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Great. Good morning, everybody. I hope, I hope this finds you all well. There's nothing better than a rainy day to force social distancing, so this rain is a good thing in many respects. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the operational aspects of tree ordinances. I've, I've worked with tree ordinances over the years. The, the very first tree ordinance I worked with was in the uh, mid-1980s with Atlanta's Fulton County. And I learned pretty early on that the um, challenges with tree ordinances beyond crafting them and writing them and getting adopted is 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 the operational aspects what I call the back end of tree ordinances how, how are these ordinances actually going to work on the ground and um, a lot of communities don't don't really give that a lot of thought you know beyond the the adoption process they don't clearly think through the implementation in a way that can optimize tree protection <clears throat> on construction sites and on the ground so uh, what I plan to do today is to examine some of the best management practices related to requirements and implementation of tree ordinances with a focus on infill development. Uh, infill has become a, a problem across all of the southern states um, as, as our attention started turning back towards living in urban areas um, and we started renewing our housing inventories in town. We, we found ourselves with a lot of old trees and a lot of big houses being built around them and, and infill development became a, a challenge. Um, one of the publications that, that Leslie will post is, is a publication that I wrote on infill development or tree protection and infill development. So it has a lot of tips in there, but I'll go through some of them today. A, a, big, a big issue, a big question that communities have is how to best regulate tree coverage and tree protection standards. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit and, and then get into specific site planning and implementation and then special encroachment techniques. Uh, when we're working with infill development around a lot of old trees, there's, there are some special techniques where you can sneak a little closer to them without impacting them. Uh, We'll talk about boundary tree conflicts, uh, how a builder might impact their neighbor's trees and how to reconcile those conflicts. And then finally talk a little bit about some enforcement tools. I do encourage you as I go through this to ask questions. I think we'll have enough time. Uh, some of the stuff gets into the weeds and it's best if you ask questions when the question arises rather than waiting till the end so that I can answer it in the context of the discussion. <laughs> Uh, we'll start with best practices, and a lot of communities find that they don't get a second chance. Uh, adopting a tree ordinance can be a contentious process at times, and 
county commissioners or city council uh, just don't want to that decision uh, passed in front of their desk a second time within a decade. Um, so you don't get a second chance when you adopt the tree ordinance, you have to get it right the first time. Uh, so it's, it's very important to do your homework, do a lot of research, identify what your issues are and clearly define your goals of the ordinance. Um, tree ordinances are not intended to be uh, growth management tools and they're not intended to stop people's values in terms of the types of houses that they build or slow down infill development. Uh, tree protection ordinances are intended to protect trees for the purpose of uh, the health and welfare of the community and, and the environmental uh, services that trees provide us. Um, so it's, it's really important to clearly define what you're trying to accomplish with your ordinance. The clear definitions are also uh, very important. Somebody just raised a question, and I can't really see what it is, Leslie. Um, <clears throat> uh, clear definitions are also important. Uh, they can't be nebul nebulous, nebulous or vague. And, and I really see a lot of, uh, well, I see lack of clarity when communities try to define a special protected class of trees. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, words like, uh, that are descriptive and and non words that are value laden um, don't really clearly define what you're trying to work with. So uh, clear clear definitions are important. And when you're defining terms in your definition sections, it's good to go to the industry. Uh, and I'll refer to the, to the A three hundred uh, series several times, but um, it, the uh, ANSI A300 series does a good job of defining terms and just for consistency across the country, I encourage using some of those definitions and, and other definitions that are presented in ISA publications uh, as, as you develop your ordinance. <clears throat> this next bullet is a really important point and that's to think through implementation on the ground. Uh, what, what is the tree ordinance going to look like beyond the paper piece of paper that you use to, to you know, write it down and get it adopted? Who on your staff is going to implement it? What's their responsibility? And, and what kind of follow through do you have? Um, it's important to build in simplicity where you can, but not compromise value for simplicity. Uh, and these next two important points were raised with the last presentation, be rigid but flexible. Flexibility is very important for your ability to negotiate issues and to, to compromise with builders and developers. So it's, it's critically important to have the flexibility to make decisions on the fly at times when you're working with builders and developers. Um, and this requires professional decision on the ground through implementation. Um, I, I don't see how communities can implement a tree protection ordinance without having a professional urban forester or arborist on staff that can make decisions. Trees are complicated biological organisms and a bad decision can affect their survival and building construction is a very complicated process and it's important to understand it. So uh, field decisions are important and that ability, building that ability into your ordinance and having the professional expertise on staff is, is critically important. Uh, the next bullet is inter integrate with other planning and infrastructure processes. Uh, it's, and that, that also speaks to flexibility, but if you can move some lines or if you can change some height restrictions or if you can relocate a sanitary sewer line uh, or add a curve to a sidewalk, uh, all, all of these things really help you protect trees and move away from them. Uh, I just saw a very good example from the city of Seattle that, that has a program in place that will allow the movement of height restrictions if the building configuration has to change because they're saving a tree. In other words, if the house is giving up some square footage to allow space for tree roots, then they're allowed to go higher. Um, and, and, and uh, I, you know, I, I think those types of, uh, of flexibilities really help a lot. Um, 
<clears throat> one key to a successful ordinance is to have your standards and specifications as a separate document, se separate guidelines, uh, because the technology changes a little bit, standards and specs change, and every time you have to make a little change or tweak or an adjustment to your program with respect to how it works technically, you, you don't want to pass it in front of your city council or, or county commissioners. <clears throat> so it's best to have separate administrative guidelines to help guide the process. And, and then finally, uh, to have something in place that can manage challenges to the ordinance um, outside of the normal appeals process. Uh, again, the ability to make decisions in the field are important uh, so long as, as you don't you know, compromise uh, normal administrative appeals processes, but it's, built, it's good to build that into your system. One of the biggest challenges that communities face is, is deciding how to regulate tree coverage and, and protection standards. And communities usually, move, or historically, I should say, have, have used a density approach. Uh, this is something that I did uh, back in the early 80s, and it was, it was copied repeatedly with, you know, through communities across the south. And density refers to basically the number of sticks per acre, how many trees do you have? What kind of tree coverage do you have? Um, my, my early density standards were based on basal area, square, square foot of basal area per, on a per acre basis. And, and I, I built that within an ecological framework, uh, basically answering the question, how many trees do we have to have in this parking lot to start recovering ecosystem services, for example? And the density approach works. It also ties in very nicely when you're integrating with other landscape requirements, like the requirements for trees and landscape strips or parking lots and buffers. Uh, but it, it sort of falls short when you are describing the, the requirements in terms of your ecological goals. Um, and, and so I see communities now moving towards a canopy-based approach uh, for standards, and it's one that I, I favor. I, I think it works very well, and I think that you can, and, and I'll get into this a little more in a second, but it, it does um, tie in more, more closely with your ecological goals. <clears throat> Making decisions as to what's an allowable impact on site, how many trees can be removed, how close can you get to a tree, <clears throat> what percentage of root damage is allowable, <clears throat> are all questions that communities ask. Um, and then, and then the whole issue of payment in lieu, which is uh, when builders or developers are offered the opportunity to uh, make a payment in lieu of planting or protecting the required number of trees. <clears throat> I also favor a payment in lieu process, especially when you're talking about uh, using a canopy based approach and I'll show this to you in a minute, but payment in lieu does afford a community um, some flexibility and uh, allowing developers to fall a little bit below standards, but still give the community a chance to get trees put back or maintain trees somewhere else. And then finally, <clears throat> require, uh, placing your requirements, your requirements in perpetuity, uh, making it clear that uh, the requirements for planting trees and saving trees doesn't end when the project gets a certificate of occupancy, but, but rather uh, that tree coverage has to remain in place Forever, and I've just recently start seeing, started seeing communities uh, record that requirement with the property deed, so that it, it is indeed a requirement in perpetuity. Uh, so the trees become just like the other infrastructure on the property. Let's talk a little bit about canopy-based ordinances and why I like them and and why they're so easy to work with. First of all, canopy is measurable and quantifiable. That means that you can go to any site large or small, and you could measure the tree canopy very easily. And using tools like uh, the iTree tools that was developed by the Forest Service, you can quantify the ecosystem services in the dollar value of that canopy. So it makes perfect sense to, to use a canopy-based approach, especially if the purpose of your tree ordinance is to protect the ecosystem services or enhance the ecosystem services that that the trees provide your community. <clears throat> um, 
so it's it's really a simple thing. The trees, uh, the, the greater the canopy, the greater the ecosystem services, um, the more effective your urban forest. The other thing about canopy-based ordinances is that um, you can you can set goals. And one thing I recommend is that as a minimum, communities uh, should establish a zero net loss goal. Uh, that means that uh, a project that comes in with uh, thirty percent tree canopy uh, finishes with 30% tree canopy. Um, of course you can't, <clears throat> you, you have to project the grow out of some baby trees that might get planted and could reach that canopy goal, but, but trees do grow. Um, and let's see if I could say that more clearly, uh, with canopy based ordinances, if you remove an oak tree that has a thousand square feet, you could plant, uh, a baby oak tree that will grow to a thousand square three feet in 15 years and give the builder credit for it. Um, ideally, you would move beyond zero net loss so that you're enhancing the canopy in your community. Uh, but enhancing the community's canopy should not just solely be based on the land development building construction process, but, but also tree planting that's done by the city, uh, and partners, nonprofit groups, organizations like that. <clears throat> but, but ultimately a community would want to overall increase its canopy. <clears throat> the other thing about canopy is that it provides for long-term monitoring. Uh, most canopy analysis studies are done with aerial photography that's collected by NAEP, which is the National Agricultural Imaging Program. And NAEP runs imagery on three-year cycles. So that means every three years, your community can get a new set of aerial photographs with which to analyze your canopy and monitor whether it's increasing or decreasing or changing the same or, or, or staying the same. I, you know, I don't recommend doing it every three years. I think maybe six years or nine years would be more appropriate. Uh, you need a little bit of window of change to do some monitoring, but it's, it, it's, it, it's a good tool to measure how you're making changes with your program. And it gives you the opportunity to tweak your program um, going forward. Uh, the density-based tree ordinances don't allow for this. Uh, so it, this is a really strong argument um, to, to using a canopy-based approach. The final thing is that canopy does provide a reasonable basis for establishing payment in lieu. And I have a, a small example down on the lower left um, uh, that I'll try to work you through. Let's just assume that um, a developer is <clears throat> falling short by a thousand square feet in tree replacement. Uh, so this is based on a thousand square feet of canopy. Uh, a two inch tree, two and a half inch tree uh, costs about $450 to purchase it, transport it, put it in the ground and pay for its establishment. Um, over the period of three years, you multiply that times a factor of about two and three quarters. That's a figure that contractors might use. Uh, so that comes out to $1,237 for that single tree, which will grow to a thousand square foot canopy in, in 15 years. And that comes down to roughly $1.25 a square foot for canopy. So $1.25 might be a reasonable number to charge a builder per square foot for canopy payment in lieu if they're, uh, so for this thousand uh, square foot deficit, the developer would pay about $1,250, uh, 2000 square feet, it would be $2,500 and so on. Canopy is easier to measure. Uh, you can do it on an individual tree basis by just measuring uh, the diameters from the longest uh, length of the tree and then the perpendicular to that and, uh, reducing it to radius, squaring it, multiplying it times pi, it's basic math. Um, or you can take shape files from aerial photographs. The photograph on the right is working with a contiguous stand of trees and it was easier to do a shape file using aerial photograph. And uh, when I've done these shape files and I, I've field tested it, it's, it's, it's been very active, uh, accurate and it's, it's pretty easy to do quickly. The other issue that comes up a lot with communities is, is working or identifying what a protected class of trees are. And there's no simple answer to this. 
Um, sometimes they're called specimen trees, heritage trees, champion trees, historic trees. Um, historic's actually easiest to work with, especially if your community has a historic commission um, that, that could have a set of criteria and, and could make a, uh, an official record of what tree might be historic or not. But the other classes are, are really difficult and it's usually pretty arbitrary to define what they are. Um, this also applies for stands of trees, ex exceptional stands of trees. Um, you know, for example, a pure stand of 30 inch American beech tree might be considered exceptional, um, but that's mostly beauty in the eye of the beholder. We know it's ecologically important, but, but how do we define that? And, and I've not really seen a good answer to that yet. Some, some, some ordinances use just strictly size or a combination of size and condition. Some communities use species size condition. Um, and at that point, we start getting into some ecological engineering. Um, we like some trees better than others, so we give some species higher credit than others. And it, and it just, it's, it's just really hard to work with, and, and I don't think it would stand up very well. So um, <clears throat> it's just a local decision as to, you know, what's a protected class. Um, I, I think you know, any native species or non-native species that performs well in an urban area of an exceptional size um, maybe should be a protected class. But um, <clears throat> the, uh, the point is that you, communities do establish uh, protected classes and they use that as a basis for either giving builders bonuses for protecting them, uh, for example, if you save that 30 inch white oak, we're gonna give you double canopy credit. Um, or they use this protected class for double penalties or something. Um, but but it's, it's a tool that communities use to try to offer protection for exceptional trees. Um, a big argument that usually weighs in is property rights and property owners. Um, right to the highest and best use of the property and how the loss of that tree might affect it. Um, and when you start getting into arguments like that, it's, it's just best to really take the long view and, and know that, you know, it's a property owner's property and it's their tree. And as long as you have requirements to put trees back, um, trees, trees do grow in time. And uh, maybe even in our, our lifetime, we'll see the same canopy coverage. So, it's a tough decision to make. Um, a mistake that I often see communities make is protecting old big trees that probably shouldn't be because of their condition. Uh, and there are some communities that I've seen protect big old trees that shouldn't be protected intentionally uh, because they wanted to make sure that there was space left behind for more trees, um, which is you know, an interesting discussion to have. More thought should be should go into the selection and placement of trees, and we tend to oversimplify. Um, thanks to uh, our utility companies, the right tree, right place philosophy. But uh, again, a long view is very important. Uh, we have to think about growing sites and conditions, and in particular, whether or not we provide adequate soil volume for our trees. Uh, and thought into diversity, and I recommend the communities to develop. Uh, species lists, and there's a species list at the bottom of this slide, or or at least the uh, the part of the table that defines what's there. And it you, you can see the kind of detail it goes into: canopy area for the development code, recommended uses, physical characteristics, environmental characteristics, and tolerances. And a lot of thought should go into what kind of species we're using for a particular ecological or environmental use and how it might perform over time, given the site con conditions that we're growing the tree in. Um, the picture on the right is a tree that I was involved with planting uh, about 1984, 85. And, and when you scale it with the garbage can to the left, which is about a 30 inch diameter, you can see that uh, in just under 40 years, this, this um, pin oak has grown to about 36 inches in diameter in a four by six cutout. Um, it's remarkable that the tree did so well in such a um, 
such a horrible space. I think it probably tapped into the wine cellar, the, the uh, restaurant that's adjacent to it. Um, but but the tree is definitely outgrown its space. It's doing damage to the sidewalk. Um, and back then, there was limited discussion or thought about the type of tree that we were putting there and the amount of soil volume that it needed. Um, so this tree survived despite it, but, but the city's going to be paying the cost for it in the long run. So a, a lot more thought going into um, tree planting is important. So now we're, we'll talk about the tree protection process um, that comes out of the ordinance. And hopefully your ordinance will build a construction tree biology overlay, which is um, requires comprehensive planning and, and also site visits. I, I see too many communities uh, working in what I call a two-dimensional process. They, they get the plans, they remove it, they review them, they approve them, and, and then work begins in the field without ever looking at the field and what the realities are out on a site. So it's important to uh, have a builder come in with a set of plans as a proposal you look at the plans and review them, and then you visit the site um, to, to see what the impacts might be. Uh, tree plan should cover a lot of information. Um, all of the trees should be located, uh, site located with, by surveyors. Um, and the trees that are being saved or being removed should be clearly identified. And, and for every project, especially where trees might be impacted, um, I, I recommend uh, uh, developing a root study, map out where the critical root zones are. Uh, this tends to be a, uh, sort of an arbitrary process. Communities will attribute um, a root radius, critical root zone radius based on the size of the tree. Uh, usually it's in the range of one foot to one and a half feet for every inch diameter of the tree, but it's, it's, it's good enough to give you an idea of the types of impacts that might occur. Um, and then all the proposals that are, are going to occur on the site, demolitions, building footprints, uh, existing and proposed utilities, grading contours, proposed grading, uh, construction corridors, material storage, uh, where, you know, where your burn pits are going and your concrete washouts, limits of disturbance. Um, and, then, and then demonstration of meeting the required tree coverage post-construction along with detailed drawings and specifications and signage. Uh, so the tree protection fencing has signs. Uh, ideally, the signs are in both English and Spanish. Um, and uh, so the whole thing is thought out in detail and every, every potential impact for trees can be expected. So before that plan's approved, your, your professional, your arborist, urban forester should meet on the site with the design professional, with the preliminary site plan, look at the trees, talk about them, evaluate their condition and whether or not they can take the impact, um, identify some potential red flags and recommend adjustments to the plan. Um, let's not save this tree because we'll be able to give the other tree on the opposite side of the house more space if we shift the house over a little bit, um, you know, those kind of decisions, or how do we, um, can we relocate the sanitary sewer line so that we're, you know, or can we flip the driveway, you know, anything to minimize the impact, but you, you can't have that discussion looking at a plan. It's best if you're out looking at the trees. And, and I found in my experience, when I'm out on a site looking at trees and talking about them with, with civil engineers or landscape architects, uh, the conversation tends to take a shift and um, they, they do want to start working with you because they start appreciating what they're seeing on the site. Um, a lot of times I'll do this with the property owner as well. So I'm walking the site with the design professional and, and the property owner. And, and it really becomes a valuable uh, part of the tree protection process. Well, oil that boils down to a, a final tree conservation plan that will show limits of disturbance, critical root zones, uh, tree replanting, your canopy calculations, location of fencing, and um, everything else in it. Uh, 
lends itself to a very nicely well organized construction site um, where trees are uh, well protected. <clears throat> a lot of times though, we have to get close to these big old guys and sometimes they're worth doing it. And there are a lot of ways that you can get closer to trees and still protect them. Uh, design modifications I've already mentioned uh, up front and they're really the best way to go if you can make some adjustments with your site and have some flexibility within your city to maybe you know change some building setbacks and move, work with your height restrictions and share driveways for example um, it, it really helps save a lot of trees uh, boring for utilities is something that should be done all of the time if there's a tree in question uh, this this Upper right hand picture is an example of uh, what I call a handheld piece of boring equipment. This piece of equipment actually uh, pushes pipe underneath the surface and it's got a directional head so you can steer the thing any way you wanna go. They also have equipment like this that, that do boring. Um, and it's, it's funny when you watch the fiber optic crews, a lot of times they will trench through tree roots and then bore underneath uh, driveway aprons uh, in this picture, they're driving underneath the basketball court. But but the thing is that it's it's a very inexpensive technology. And if you can get 30 inches below the ground, if, you're, if your grading contours work well and your profile is working well, you can get underneath the roots and they won't even know that, that the utility line's there. Uh, the use of retaining walls also work very well. Um, and... <clears throat> Some of these retaining walls uh, use a design similar to what you see on the lower right-hand picture with the, the pier and beam design for the, this house addition. Um, let's see if I can get my laser pointer here. Uh, these, these, um, these posts are, are just screwed in. They're, they're not dug in, but they're screwed in, and, and then they pour some concrete around it. Uh, when I walked out on this side, I got a little bit upset about the concrete washout in the middle of the tree save area, but we we ultimately pulled all that up and they laid down some, you know, broke up the compaction with hand tools and laid down some filter fabric and gravel and um, these trees are still alive today. In this case, we didn't use tree fencing, but we put batter boards up because it was just impossible to, to have fencing in such a tight site. But you can see that they even... Uh, rebuilt the foundation of the house using the same post and beam design, uh, which, which works very well. So um, this same technology can be used for retaining walls if you have to get closer to trees. And with aeration systems on the backside, I've seen it used very successfully. So um, it takes a little forethought and it's not really that much more expensive than building a continuous um, footing, which would have destroyed the trees. So um, these types of encroachment techniques work really well. Um, planning through temporary egress and storage by using mulch and plywood, uh, the use of radial trenching, um, pervious surface, and, and working with hand tools are all um, uh, tools in our palette for encroaching closer to trees and minimizing their impact. Boundary trees tend to become a problem with infill development. Uh, and you can see with the photo on the left that there's uh, some grading and fill material. And on the other side of the fence, there's a neighbor's tree whose roots are being damaged by construction activities from the house next door. Um, this happens over and over and over again. And uh, it's just a difficult situation. So communities are now starting to move towards uh, the placement of boundary trees on tree protection plans so that we can think through these impacts and mitigate them. Uh, so identifying the potential impact and then requiring protection of neighbors' trees is a neighborly thing to do. Uh, and sometimes it requires a written agreement between neighbors, we call them boundary tree agreements, uh, where the home builder will agree to remove and replace a construction damaged tree after some you know, X period of time, usually three years, uh, if if the tree, if they get, you know, three years after they get their certificate of occupancy, the tree dies. Um, what that does is incentivize the builder to do the right thing um, going forward. And, and it really help, helps 
prevent unnecessary tree damage. Uh, one of the ways that we enforce these boundary tree impacts is with performance bonds or cash bonds. Uh, so it's a little bit extra work on the part of the city to hold the bond in a file, but uh, it does help protect the neighbors considerably. So we've thought about encroachment techniques. We've got our plan. We've walked, we've walked the site. We've developed our tree protection plan. Uh, the next part is site implementation. And uh, again, it's, it's incumbent upon the city to have a professional on staff that can meet with the contractor and subcontractor and builder and owner to talk about what was all planned before construction begins. Uh, so it, it's an important part of follow-up and it's a statement that the city makes saying that we're serious about this tree protection. Before you do anything, I wanna see these fences in place or as soon as you're done clearing, I wanna see these fences in place. And um, we're gonna be following up two or three times to uh, make sure that uh, what we're looking for is being followed. Let me pause here just for a minute and turn this laser pointer off. Uh, so, so the pre-construction conference is the first step in implementing the plan, uh, but it's important for the arborist or urban forester to be available on a 24 seven basis, pretty much to answer questions that builders and contractors might have. It, it's, it's helpful to them if they know that there's a professional on staff that, that could answer their questions. A lot of communities defer to consultants. They, um, uh, builders will call and raise a question and city staff will say, well, hire a consultant, they'll answer your question and then we'll, we'll review their reply and then go from there. And it just slows the process down. Time is money for these guys. It's best to be available and answer their questions as quickly as you can. Uh, Follow-up visits are important uh, and it's important to develop a set of check, uh, develop a checklist of the types of things the arborists might look for on their follow-up visits. Um, many times, many cities will defer to building inspectors or soil erosion control inspectors uh, to do follow-up follow -up visits for tree protection on site. And, uh, and that's when these checklists check really become important. They're not professionals uh, in urban forest arbor culture, and they may not know what to look for. Uh, so it's just important to, to make sure that all that information is in their hands. And then the need for vigilance is important. <clears throat> uh, you can protect trees until the cows come home, but if, if after the owner gets their certificate of occupancy, they trench the roots for an irrigation system, uh, you still lost the tree. So uh, that type of follow-up is very important. Uh, homeowners in these new houses uh, need to understand. And, and again, some type, some type of written documentation that you can hand over at this, with the certificate of occupancy saying these trees are required. Um, you know, there's ways you can damage them or ways you can maintain them. Uh, you know, please be watchful for your trees, I, I think would go a long way. And, and then uh, there's the whole issue of enforcement. <clears throat> enforcement per se doesn't work. I've seldom seen a builder or developer intentionally do something wrong. I've seen them accidentally or naively screw things up a lot. Um, so the word enforcement doesn't even really work for me. It, it's sort of like continued implementation, but there are some tools that can force correction. Uh, some of them, well, the list is here, stop work orders, uh, asking builders to make corrections on site. Uh, communities are now developing a process for mitigating by way of prescription. And there's an example of a prescription on, on the right. Uh, or if trees are accidentally removed, uh, plan revisions that will allow some canopy adjustments and more replacement. Withholding certificates of occupancy and in posting of performance bonds are all tools that could that could write a wronged project. project. Um, you'll notice that I don't offer citations. They don't really work. And the fines don't really help anybody um, except the local public schools. And 
not that I have any problem with local public schools, but it's really important to get trees put back in the ground or fix trees that might have been damaged. So uh, it's better not to think of this as enforcement, but really a continued implementation of the tree ordinance. Would all of these tools work? And that's it. I wanted to make sure I left enough time for questions. So um, I am now open for questions if anybody has any. Great, thank you, Ed. Um, I have, you've covered a lot of information um, and there's a lot of um, opportunity there for a lot of municipalities. So we've got about, you know 20 25 minutes or so that we can do some questions this is a time that um you know if you do have questions as a participant if you go into the chat dialog box um and just type out your question we can uh allow ed some time to get to each one it's an opportunity for you guys to get clarification from him on on anything he's got a lot of experience and knowledge on what works what doesn't within the tree protection world um so it's an opportunity for you guys to pick his brain um so just type out the question and we'll bring, uh, bring attention to it and give him a few minutes to respond. Um, just while folks are doing that, the one question that popped out at me, Ed, and I get a lot of uh, inquiries about this because a lot of North Carolina communities, and I don't, I'm don't, i assuming that other states are in similar situations, don't necessarily have a city arborist on staff um, or except for like the larger communities. So for those smaller communities that may not have a city arborist or a lot of uh, you know, certified arborist inspectors, how would you recommend um, they address the, the enforcement side of things? And maybe even the pre-planning as, as far as identifying. Um, well, what I've seen is, is small communities um, sort of cluster together and, and hire a circuit rider as a consultant to help them with the implementation of their ordinance. Uh, it's it's um, it's something that would work. Uh, you know, the use of consultants is good if if you have a reliable source to go through go to, and and some consistency. It's important that the consultant really understand what um, what the expectations are and the goals of the community. Follow it through, but but it's I, I've I've seen it work in a lot of communities. Um, up until a point where the, the magnitude of scale just gets too big for a single individual to manage, and then it's time for them to hire somebody. I've had a couple other questions pop in, and I'm going to try to get to a couple of them. One, um, there's a lot of questions. Uh, one, one question was about covering post-development situations, in particular, uh, tree removal permit process that requires compliance by residential owners. And uh, the answer is yes, that, that's something you can write into your ordinance. Uh, some, some communities kind of shy away from requirements with single family homes, but if you do, uh, there's one community I work with, Decatur, Georgia, that requires um, homeowners to apply for a permit and they allow them to remove three healthy trees a year uh, or, or it was a one healthy tree a year up to three trees over a three year period uh, and and otherwise uh, try to encourage discussion to uh, dis discourage tree removal or recover canopy. So it's sort of a, a a soft regulatory approach. I mean, sometimes people want to remove trees because they want a vegetable garden or you know, a swimming pool, and that's a legitimate use of your property. So um, you know, I, I think a soft regulatory approach is a good way to go with that. Uh, let me, I saw another question. Let me see if I can scroll the chat box up. Um, examples of boundary tree agreements we can reference. Uh, yes, I do. Um, and uh, Leslie, what's the best way to get that to you? Can I just email it to you and you'll, uh, maybe if I can do or having this discussion, you can post it with the rest of the documents. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll if you send it to me, I can get that um, out to them, and I'll I'll post those three documents and your presentation all, uh, in just a few minutes for people to download, and then I can also email any of that kind of stuff to any the attendees um, later today. Okay, and um, I will try to multitask and answer questions while I'm, I'm pulling that up to email to you. So bear with me if I pause for a second or. Well, I can read up some while you're doing that. Um, so. A question that came up, uh, how can you write in maintenance for tree health, pruning, and et cetera? Is that a shared cost? Yeah, 
can't multicast. What was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. It's talking about how you write in maintenance for tree health, um, such as pruning, and if that is considered a shared cost or what's worked with others. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how can you write a maintenance for tree health, pruning, et cetera. Uh, I've never seen a requirement written in for tree health in an ordinance um, requiring homeowners or builders to maintain the health of the tree. So uh, I, I've never seen that. I, I, I have seen requirements related to uh, trees at risk. Uh, uh, requiring homeowners to mitigate risk or to remove trees, uh, especially if they present, well, if, if the tree is at risk, it's presenting um, a hazard to, or uh, to, you know, property value or people, so. Okay. Uh, another question, I've seen municipalities use canopy drip line as the boundary for tree protection zones. Do you consider that sufficient? It depends. Uh, it depends on the type of soils you have and, and really where you are geographically. I think if you're on the coastal zone, uh, drip line may work because the soils are sandier and tree rooting might be a little bit deeper. Uh, if you're in the Piedmont, drip line isn't adequate at all. So it, you just have to think about where you are. Uh, another question, can you talk about definitions of sever pruning and how it can be, uh, or is that severe pruning? I don't know if the uh, sever or not severe, and <laughs> how it can be mitigated. So the question is, um, how do you define uh, prune, root pruning of trees? And I, I would defer to the A300 standard on, uh, on construction. And I think there's one on root management uh, that, that addresses this issue. Ideally, it's better to make a clean cut with roots that you're cutting, certainly not roots within the structural root plate, and certainly not more roots than, than, than the, you know, the loss, the, the true loss that the tree can sustain. Um, pruning should be done with really sharp tools so you're not tearing or shredding. Uh, and uh, it, should be, it should be avoided wherever possible. So, uh, it, it's it's probably best to, in terms of your definitions of your ordinance, uh, discourage it, but try to follow the uh, A300 standards in defining it. Any other questions? So what municipality <laughs> has the most comprehensive tree protection ordinances? Um, I see a lot of good communities out west. I would look at Seattle. Um, I think Atlanta has one that they're going through some revisions right now. Uh, Atlanta certainly has one of the largest staffs that I've ever seen. So they have an army of arborists that are out there working in the field. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, I believe that Raleigh has a pretty good ordinance. Uh, and I would look at what Charlotte has, but I, I can't recall. One of the publications that Leslie's posting um, will have a lot of ordinance case case examples in it. So I would, I would turn to that. I'm gonna put them up right now. So just give me one minute and everybody should see um, those. Uh... Did I cover all the questions? Are there any other questions that I did not? Uh, someone made a comment about James Irvin, who's a landscape architect from, from um, Arlington. I was just talking to Jim yesterday. Um, uh, the comment was Jim was a big advocate in the 80s for using the correct tree and having enough growing environment for the tree size. And, and that's very true. Jim Irvin was a pioneer in that area. And, and a lot of his work led to the development of um, the Silva cell, which, which is now widely used throughout the state of North Carolina. And, and I encourage its use, uh, especially in lieu of structural soils. The Silva cell just works so much better. It's a, it's a really good good product to use. Any other questions? I haven't seen any others come in. Um, we still have a few minutes, so if people want clarification on anything, um, now's the opportunity. I did 
um, share four different files. Hopefully you've seen a window come up on your end that you can download directly. Um, it's the three publications that has developed um, for tree protection ordinances um, for North Carolina and other states that can follow. And then I have a copy of his uh, presentation for today as a PDF that everybody can download. Um, so I'm going to leave those up and let everybody have a chance to, to download those if they so choose. Those publications are also available um, on the North Carolina Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry website. So we, we can find them um, at that point if you so choose. Um, so we do have, let's see. We do have I, just sent you the, I just sent you the boundary tree agreement, so you'll be able to load that in as well. Okay, let me find that real quick while everybody is working. I can get that downloaded and um, and uploaded for everybody. Okay, um, so while um, I'm doing this, I'll try and do a you know, multitask again. Um, so for those that joined a little bit late or this is the first time attending, in order for um, you to get credit for different uh, Education, continuing education. If you haven't sent me your certification certification numbers for arborist, forester, landscape architect, or landscape contractor, please do so. Um, I took attendance throughout, and will be able to uh, track everybody that way. Um, and then uh, I can share um, certificates of attendance with everybody. Um, Later today or tomorrow, I should be emailing that out to everybody. Uh, I'm going to come in and kind of share this last file that Ed just did. I, I had another question just pop sure. up too, Leslie. Um, okay. Do you think do you think density or canopy is a better way to measure tree retention? And and I addressed that earlier on. I I I, I think canopy is clearly the way to go, um, and for a variety of reasons, it's easy to measure. Uh, and it's measure it's measurable and quantifiable so you can tie ecosystem services to canopy so it's it's definitely uh the way to, to way to go okay excellent um i haven't seen any other questions come in on my end um i will say that we do have uh two more webinars um for those that have not uh registered for those coming up um in Ju in june um, so something to keep an eye out for there. Um, in the, let's see, in, on June 9th and June 23rd, um, more on that might be more appropriate for some uh, folks out in the field. Um, but so the education credits have been approved for today. I kind of listed them here. Uh, you can always follow up with me um, on the certification numbers after the fact. I haven't seen any other questions come in. Um, so if you want, if you didn't get a chance to download those documents or you want those, please just send me an email and I can get those out to everybody. Um, and I didn't see anything else come through. So Ed, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule and, and your morning to present this topic. It's a, it's a really complex topic that you can probably spend an entire day on. And we'll probably have a couple other webinars on hitting on different aspects of tree ordinances and tree protection. Um, to kind of help guide people through that process. Um, but I appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. Um, anything you want to close out on, Ed, or are you? Nope, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, excellent. So everybody, thank you for joining us today. Keep an eye out for the um, your certificates of attendance for the different education credits. I'll